Vaporwave, a microgenre with a philosophy, a philosophy with an aesthetic, a trend that came in fast and then simmered back into the fringe. It's a divisive style, and it's one that's currently suffering from that post-trend tackiness. But like it or not, and I personally do, it's had more of an influence on pop culture today than you might realize. Now, if you're not familiar with the genre, or you just need a refresher, here's what Vaporwave sounds and looks like. But now, with the height of Vaporwave's cultural impact thoroughly in the rearview mirror, I think it's possible to pick up the pieces and get a better picture of what the hell happened. Hopefully I can do this without waxing philosophical too, too much. But there's one thing that definitely hasn't changed since the height of Vaporwave's popularity, and that's that fans, artists, cultural critics, they all have difficulty agreeing on some of the genre's most basic aspects, like when did it begin? Does it have a goal? Is it tacky or self-aware or both? Also, does it even have what it takes to be called a genre of music or is it a micro-genre? Is that genre, sub-genre, micro-genre, maybe nano-genre under that? I don't know. And this can make it a pretty controversial subject because just like a lot of different genres, vaporwave means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So in order to get a better understanding of this controversy, it's important to remember what vaporwave at its core has always been about. The emptiness of consumerism? Sure. City pop samples? Yeah. Aesthetics that reclaim corporate symbols ironically? Also yes. But I think the clearest, most basic characteristic that Vaporwave possesses is that Vaporwave is about pain. Now, I know that's an extreme statement, but pain is an undeniable part of this microgenre's phenomenology. And the pain that Vaporwave deals in is of a very peculiar brand. Here it's equal parts fatalistic and mournful. See, Vaporwave often relies on samples of music from the 80s and the 90s, which is an era perceived by many as being more optimistic in general. But the music's chopped up, distorted take purposefully makes the nostalgic slightly out of reach, lonely, even dead. It lets you toy with nostalgia, but it never lets you slip into escapist pleasure the same way you could with an original track from the 80s. Now I know this is a dark take, but it's not at all meant to be a dig at fans or people who make this music. I think it's what makes Vaporwave interesting. Although there's certainly a group of hyper-protective scenesters that understandably want to protect a genre of music that they see as being perpetually misunderstood. And I get that. I'm not an expert. I'm just a generalist music nerd, I guess. And I'm trying to reignite the conversation a little bit. And I think it's the perfect time for that because more than a decade since Vaporwave's rise, it's left us with a lot of unanswered questions. Questions that I actually believe the internet did find answers to in its own way, but more on that later. For the first few years, the music that would become Vaporwave existed only as an obscure internet niche, a meme created by DIY home production tinkerers and audio nerds. But once it was noticed by mainstream youth culture in the West, it poured over the internet like a spilled Crystal Pepsi. Depending on who you ask, Vaporwave's origin story can differ wildly. Some begin with the chopped and screwed hip-hop music from the late 80s and early 90s, some with the widespread availability of DAWs for home recording, while others go all the way back to the first synths developed in the 50s and 60s. I'm going to begin here with this album, 2010's Eco Jams by Chuck Person. I think it's the first true Vaporwave record to really grip the internet. Also, before you drop your correction in the comments, as I often point out with other genres, the name of a genre often isn't there from the beginning. This music was not called Vaporwave. It was just a musical experiment. Another Plunderphonic offshoot. Plunderphonics. Plunderphonics is a musical genre in which tracks are constructed by sampling recognizable works of music. The album opens up with a slowed and chopped sample of Toto's Africa. And immediately you can hear some of Vaporwave's defining characteristics. Slow, pitch-shifted vocal samples, repeating loops, and a distorted lo-fi texture. If you check out this album and you're not into Vaporwave, you might find this to be a difficult listen. Daniel Lopatin, the artist behind Chuck Person, had a very specific purpose in the creation of Eco Jams, a purpose that would echo through Vaporwave's entire history. He told a reporter for Line of Best Fit that it was a cathartic and subversive response to an overly anesthetized commercial music landscape. It was a way of making use of our debris in an individuated way, to express something personal with something extremely impersonal. 
It didn't take long after the release of EcoJams for chat rooms, image boards, and DIY music distribution to quickly channel this new sound into something with common characteristics. Soon, a scene developed, a tight-knit group of producers coping and reacting to the same pain behind Daniel Lopatin's project. Album artwork and music videos on YouTube built an aesthetic, and artists and fans alike stitched together a shared understanding of the genre's meaning a phenomenology built on the hollowness of capitalist consumerism and nostalgia for a time when this hollowness went largely unnoticed. Even the name Vaporwave itself is a tongue-in-cheek reference to vaporware, a Silicon Valley term for software that's been announced but may never be released. Essentially, it's a hyped-up pitch, a promise, but with little work actually in development. For the digital generation, feeling that the check of 80s and 90s consumerism had ultimately bounced, this music struck a deep emotional chord. But Vaporwave wasn't yet the driving, shitposting cultural force that we know it as today. I would argue that this changed with the 2011 release of Floral Shop by Macintosh Plus. This is an album that's often seen as the definitive Vaporwave sound. And that album cover might look familiar to you even if you've never really fell down the Vaporwave rabbit hole. That iconic marble bust, the 80s graphics, both had a massive influence on the visual aesthetic of the genre. And I think given all that's happened between now and 2010, it can be easy to forget how strong both the sound and the visual aesthetic of Vaporwave were. It was pervasive. It dripped its way into movies, it influenced pop music. Its look was even ironically co-opted by television advertisements. But I think it's worth mentioning that this was often blended with a similar and somewhat related aesthetic that would become known as Outrun. That and a booming 1980s cultural revival that was exploding in mainstream entertainment. And I think this is why vaporwave heads can be such meme purists. Because the borders of vaporwave are blurry. Not that this is different than other genres, but vaporwave borders other genres that it has fundamental philosophical differences with. Or at least that's how some fans perceive it. But it didn't take long for simmering tension to grow in the vaporwave community. And this is partly because of the massive wave of new artists and labels that flooded streaming services. There is so much Vaporwave and so much Vaporwave adjacent music that by 2018, the Vaporwave space was pretty saturated. Some of this stuff is pretty low effort and it's clearly trying to cash in on streaming time. Many Vaporheads feel like the good stuff has been crowded out by all this noise, slowly diluting the aesthetic, the feeling, the political drive that this style once possessed. So the golden age of Vaporwave did come to an end, but I think it would be a little silly to say that Vaporwave is dead. The death of Vaporwave has been declared year after year since the mid 2010s, but it still has a devoted following, it has purists, casual listeners, fusion artists pushing the envelope. It may not be the trend of the year, but echoes of Vaporwave aesthetically and musically can still be seen and heard all around the internet. And I think Vaporwave is still with us because the problems that Vaporwave was responding to still exist. Many young people feel alienated in the now and yearn for a promise of a better tomorrow. Vaporwave offers no solution to this, not even an escape, but it does offer commiseration, a recognition of your suffering. The only mitigation it really provides is that you're not alone. It's written in YouTube views and Spotify streams. There are others that feel this way too. Of course, for many, this is not enough. The aching heart of the internet always seeks new forms of comfort. And in this case, it began reaching out for a pure nostalgia. This all reminds me of something I read from John Koenig's Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. It's a word he coined, one anamoya, defined as nostalgia for a time or place one has never known. If the saying is true that the past is like another country, then Anamoya is dreaming about a country altogether unfamiliar, but also deeply missed, mourned even. And this is where Japanese city pop comes in. As many early Vaporwave songs sample Japanese music from the 80s, the sources of these samples also began to gain traction. This is not the only factor that led to city pop's resurgence, but it's certainly one of the most important. For this reason, the resurgence of city pop followed Vaporwave, seemingly reaching its peak when Vaporwave was on the retreat. I recently did a video on city pop, its origins, and the resurgence that happened in the 2010s. And during my research, I poured over pages and pages of YouTube and Reddit comments with people sharing some of the many reasons for loving this fascinating era in Japanese pop music. Now, there are parallels here to the comments section of any Vaporwave post, but there are also a few key differences. Listening to City Pop also provides a feeling of animoia, but allows for a more complete and satisfying escapism. City Pop doesn't directly show you the detritus of consumer culture. 
It only gives you the raw, unadulterated optimism of a country undergoing an economic boom. The coming hard times, the collapse of superheated growth, that sits off stage, only clear in retrospect. Reflecting on that fact might bring melancholy, but it's not directly baked into the music itself. It almost seems like when given a choice between adding meaning to one's suffering and finding a temporary bomb for that suffering, the internet-bound doomers among us began to prefer the latter. This is also true of Vaporwave's most successful offshoot, Future Funk. Some consider this to be part of Vaporwave, but the musical characteristics vary so wildly that Future Funk definitely feels like its own thing. Future Funk, much like City Pop, has a different approach to the pain of Vaporwave. Where Vaporwave chooses hypnotic melancholy, Future Funk goes for danceability, funkiness, fun. If Vaporwave is pessimistic, Future Funk is absurdist, partying at the end of meaning. Again, when presented with the haunting satire of Vaporwave, or the exciting diversion of Future Funk, the internet trend machine began selecting the second option. Although here I am waxing philosophical like I promised I wouldn't do at the beginning of the video. But I honestly think we'll continue to see microgenres in this vein. Nostalgia and escapism have both been part of music for a long time. But as the specific pain we're responding to changes and we explore new ways to cope, I'm sure the music will change as well. But that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed our look back at Vaporwave and have some sort of weird hankering to hang out in an abandoned McDonald's from the 90s or something like that. As always, thank you so much for watching. Please give this video a like if you found it interesting and subscribe for more videos on music and musical genre. It really helps me out and it's much appreciated. And I'll see you in the virtual plaza.